Today. Let's all stand as we sing to the mighty king today. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see y'all. Well, summer's hit. We have a lot of people gone, but, and it's supposed to be 100 degrees for now several more days. <clears throat> this last week, it got so hot, I had to make a plan to cool off. So 
On Tuesday, Ben Levins and I took off to uh, Niangua River, and it's spring-fed, if you remember, and it was hot that day, but we went, went down and we would dive down into the water um, and recover treasure. I always find all kinds of stuff. And uh, we were diving and everything. We got back in our kayaks. We were going along, and I was cold. I was doing this, and I looked over, and he says, I'm shivering, and I said, so am I. And we never got warm one time on that river. The breeze, we had a nice little breeze, and uh, it, it was so nice because it felt like it was 70-some degrees because our, body, our body's temperatures had dropped, core had dropped, and we were just kayaking, and then we'd stop and go back down into the water and look for stuff under root balls and stuff. So, yeah, we didn't sweat until we got on the bus to come back to the cars. So I'm just saying, there's your plan for this week. Go to the spring-fed river and dive under it. We came across this raft, and it had a woman. She was in dry clothes and a man, and she had sweat rolling down her face. And I'm like, you know, eventually you probably ought to jump in. I know, it looks like it's coming to that. And I'm like, why would you go to the river and not get wet? I don't understand that. <laughs> Vern, you like getting wet on that river, don't you? Anyway, that was my plan for cooling off with 100 degree weather. Why don't you have a seat? <clears throat> Don't hardly have any announcements. We've got several getting ready to start. I mean, shoot, we've got Paul's Kitchen starting. That's not till September. We've got Judo getting ready to start up. We'll, we'll talk about all that. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to throw a bunch of kids around again. It's been a while since I've, you know. So, anyway. Hey, guys, there's a few things I, li uh, I ask for you when you come into the congregation here. Um, the first one is to check in. If you're on Facebook, to check in on Facebook. And you go, like you're going to post something, you hit the, that line, and then it will bring up a whole bunch of things. It will say check in. Put, hit that, and then it will bring up what you're close to, obviously Christ community. Anyway, check in. And to me, it's like free advertising. And some people may say, well, I didn't know yet they went there. Then they turn around and say, well, I didn't know they went to church there either. And that sort of thing. So it's, it's free advertising for the church, and I appreciate you doing that. The second thing is to wear your name tags. It's very important for the fellowshipping of the church to have name tags on. You may not believe that, but, but it's true. It helps a great deal with fellowshipping. And yes, eventually they may not need to look at your name tag. But at first, as people are getting to know you, it's great to have that name tag. And this is a large church. We've got four different services. In fact, Saturday night service was huge because we had that movie. But it is easy, you know, you can go to any service. But if you have your name tag, people go, oh yeah, okay, yeah. And I put a name with a face. Okay, and uh, then the, the last thing that I ask people to do is uh, to talk to people, say hello to people, um, try to get to know people. And do this in the parking lot, you know, if you park next to someone, say good morning. You know, and even walk in talking with them perhaps. Um, and talk to people you don't know. Most of us are comfortable talking to the people we already know. But sometimes we say hello to people we don't know. We had a new couple in Saturday night service, <clears throat> and I sat down to talk with him just a bit before service began, and he said, well, this is a very unfriendly church. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry, you know. He said, yeah, only five or six people have already said hi to us, you know, and he starts laughing. Um, but that's the kind of church you want. I want a church that people can feel like they can make friends in. And it all starts with us being saying, hi, good morning, I'm so-and-so, and they'll tell you your name, and who knows, you know, you may be meeting your next best friend. And so do it in the hallways, do it as you come into the service, when you sit down, say hi to people around you. This is very important to do. I always say, you know, if someone's within uh, uh, five to eight foot of you, say hi to them, if you can, like you're crossing them in the hallway. Um, guys, and then... Uh, it's amazing how people will come. Sometimes they're hurting, and they come into the church, and then they hear the service, and they hear the Word of God, and they meet the people. We have special people, very special people here. 
and then they, uh, they want to come back, and then they come back pretty soon. One of you all invite them to a Sunday school class where they're going to learn the Word, and then they'll be wanting to go down and be baptized and such. So anyway, that's, uh, that's three of the things that I ask you to do when you come into the church here at Christ Community. I want to invite the ushers to come forward to receive our tithes and offerings this morning. Father, as they come, um, we have come prepared to give to you. We are ready to give so that great things might happen in people's lives, both here in the area that we live in and around the state and indeed around the world. And so, Father, we honor you by our gift. Amen.
Sam. Sam's been part of our church for a long, 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 long time. <laughs> well, guys, in our prayers today, um, Ty's going to lead us in our prayers. He's been gone on vacation. He found a way to beat the heat was to go out to the Colorado mountains. And so, yeah. And they, he told me that a lot of the places they went, it was still 90 degrees up there. And I'm like, well. And I said, did you go to Silverton? I I told him, go up to Silverton. It's nice around 74 degrees up Silverton. It's way up in the mountains. He said, no, they went to purgatory. And I'm like, purgatory? That's just right next to hell. <laughs> so that's, where, that's where they went, it's purgatory. So, anyway, um, we have several to pray for. B.J. Knutson. B.J. attends the 815 service. He moved here about four years ago from uh, California. And uh, he began to attend church with some family he had here. And uh, he began to be in Sunday school. Pretty soon he began to grow. He gave his life to Christ. I baptized him down at the creek. In fact, he, he will tell you he's the oldest person that I've ever baptized. And he, it is true. I think he was 90 when he got baptized. And uh, so uh, and he now is on hospice care and his home. I was able to go by and visit him this week. Um, Becky Jacobs, I saw her come in. She had a procedure this week. Um, Sandra Moyer, she is in a Springfield hospital after surgery. She should be getting out today. She probably is watching online right now. And then Eileen uh, DeWilt, she had uh, surgery down in Texas, and uh, she has been diagnosed with cancer as well. So Please be in prayer um, for these folks, and maybe some that I didn't know about, but uh, um, I know a lot of you guys might have your own prayer concerns for different things happening in, in your life. So, Ty, would you lead us? God, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you that... You are the example of what is good. God, we think that we know things that are good and we know things that make us happy, but every good thing is rooted in you because you are the only good thing in the whole universe. And God, in spite of that, in spite of your goodness and your perfection and our imperfection, you still have made a way for us to have a relationship with you. And you give us a promise of goodness and in our lives right now and for a hope in our future. And God, we see that in so many different ways. You give us so many good things now and it's just a small taste into what eternity with you is going to be like. And God, even though it is a hard thing for us to lose people and to know that somebody in our lives is about to leave us, we thank you that we have the hope and the joy that comes from knowing what eternity with you is going to entail. God, that's why we come into your house and celebrate your goodness and your mercy this morning. We thank you that you give us this place and this time where we can come and unburden ourselves of all of the troubles of the world, all of the things that weigh us down during the week, and we can just focus on you and the love that you have for each and every one of us. So God, we thank you for the promise that you give to BJ. And God, I ask that for the people that are dreading the inevitable, that you would comfort them and remind them that he's going home. And God, for everyone that can't be here this morning for a lot of different reasons, for the people that are on the list that we've lifted up that are recovering from procedures and illnesses and things like that, we ask that you would continue to heal and strengthen their bodies and for people that are traveling because they're on vacation and so many other reasons that people can't be here today, we ask that they would feel the same peace and reassurance that we feel here this morning being in your house. We ask for a blessing on them the same way we ask for your blessing on all of us this morning. God, as we continue to worship and praise you this morning, we ask that your spirit would guide everything that we do, 
that you would help us to lift up songs of praise that glorify you, but that also connect us to you in a personal and relational level. And God, I ask that the message that you've given Chris would speak directly to all of our hearts and our minds this morning. We thank you and praise you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we honor God with our presence today here, let's stand as we honor God with our singing today. Lord. 
Father God, there is none like you today that we worship. We love you. We sing your praise. We hear your word spoken today, Lord. May you speak mightily through your messenger. May we hear, may we receive and believe. Thank you for this church. In your awesome name we pray. Amen. When I was young, I would spend a lot of the time on my grandfather's farm. Um, we lived in Springfield, so I was able to go to school in Springfield and have, have the best life of a town, you might say. But I loved going to the farm. So every weekend, all summer, you know, any break, Christmas break, I would always be out on the farm. Literally, Friday after school, my mom would run me down there and I would be able to be on this farm. And this is where I learned so much um, about how to do things on my own. It taught me how, uh, how to work hard um, and a rewarding experience on a farm. Took, and I learned about engineering. In fact, in high school, I took a national engineering test. And I scored a 98th percentile across the United States. And I got called down to the office. Now, it was not unusual for me to get called down to the office. But this one was for a good thing, and one of the counselors met me and said, Hey, you scored a 98% on this national engineering test, and we think you need to go to engineering school. I said, Well, that's great. Except I don't like math very much. Uh, so I kind of x that out. But this is where I learned it. I mean, on, on the test, I remember they'd say, How do you speed up this machine? Well, it had pulleys. Put a smaller pulley on that, it'll speed it up. You know, and stuff like that, it was easy if you're raised on the farm. Um, but uh, so, so anyway, I learned how to fix things and, and learned how to weld. I learned how to run a, a forge, um, all kinds of different things. So I, I love that experience on the farm. And my grandpa and I were very, very close. He owed a, owned a uh, farm in Stratford, and he owned a farm in Fairgrove. And back a long time ago, you know, I've shared with you, my family's been in the Ozarks since 1827 in Greene County. And they had their first farm in 1828. Imagine how long ago. And so the farm kept growing and growing. The unfortunate thing is that you had a lot of kids to run the farm. And so when someone died, they left the land to, uh, to their kids. And it kept getting split up and split up. At one time, he owned several thousand acres there in Greene County. Um, but it kept getting split up. But my grandfather would rent a lot of land in between the two farms. And he'd rent, a lot of the places we'd rent were some kind of family member to me, cousins or great uncles or whatever it might be. And so we would rent that land. And the rental agreement was, was done by a handshake. Back in that day, you didn't need a piece of paper. If two, two people got together and said, all right, that's a deal, and they shook hands, that was better than any contract a lawyer could write up. And so the process was that Grandpa would rent that land for the year, and he would be responsible for planting it and harvesting and using his labor for whatever crop, you know, sometimes it was wheat crops, sometimes corn, um, a lot of times it was just a hay crop, and we'd harvest that a couple of times. But the agreement was always that the landowner got a third of what you produced. That's the rental agreement. And that way, if, if you had a drought or something, everyone suffered. The landowner suffered because he... He didn't get this third on the, you know, he got a third of whatever was there, but with a the drought there wasn't much. And I remember um, going through, and my grandpa was a stickler on this to make sure that he was he keeping his end of the bargain. And we'd go through baling of hay, and we'd go through, and he'd say, now remember, every third bale you leave in the field. So I'd go through and pick up the first bale, pick up and, and buck the second bale, up and I just walk past the third bale and then start all over again and when we were done a third of the crop was laying in the field for the owner to come by and pick it up uh, whenever we planted wheat we had a we had a um, uh, combine we had a wheat truck and so we'd run 
weed into town. And it was amazing. They put your truck there and they do some, you know, they take a sample to see what the moisture was in the grain and was there any particulates in there, were there weed seeds and garlic and everything else in there. And then they would raise this lift and the truck would be at a 45 degree degree angle, mind you, and all the grain was coming down out of it. That was amazing. They could lift a grain truck like that. And then it, my grandpa would get the receipt saying how many bushels of grain was in his truck, and they didn't make sure that the landowner got a third. And I loved the farm life. I learned how to do so much. I was running the rake at 11 to 12 and by 13 I was running the hay bind um, and so that was a great time on the farm and I learned a lot about loyalty hard work respect and I learned how to do a deal you did a deal with a handshake and we would go out and uh, collect the harvest of all, all these rented fields we had our farm and the Fairgrove Farm, all planted as well, so it kept us busy in the summer. But I learned that the owner of the land always got a third. And the reason I'm telling you this is it goes along with the parable that I'm going to share today. Over the next several weeks, I'm starting a new uh, series on the parables of Jesus. These are stories, stories about everyday life that Jesus would tell. And the reason I think he, he shared these stories, you remember, remember stories. You probably will always remember me talking about that lift that would lift the truck up in the air so it drained grain out of the back end of it. But if I told you a theological paragraph, you'd be like, what? I don't, do you remember what he said today? No, I don't remember. So we remember stories, and stories are part of our lives, aren't they? I love talking to older folks, and they always have amazing stories. Sometimes the young don't have stories yet, but stories are part of who we are. And so Jesus told stories because people could remember them. And, and we call them parables. And these parables or stories that Jesus told would also have a deeper spiritual meaning. You'd have to figure out what is Jesus trying to tell us with his story. And so we dig deep for the spiritual meaning. And these, these parables, all of us can relate to them, all of us can understand them, and it's kind of open-ended in time, and there's different things that people can pull out as well. And one thing I like about many of the parables, they teach what God wants of us. In fact, my favorite is the, the uh, parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15. It actually teaches what the very heart of God is like, that he wants all of us to be in a relationship with him. He calls us back. He wants us to be with him. And so that's why I like the parables so much. And so we're going to share the parables. Um, let's jump into the scripture. Oh boy. I'm getting taller. Because it's further down the floor, so I must be getting taller. Chapter 21 in Matthew, um, in this it's entitled The Parable of the Tenants. That wasn't there in the original script, obviously. People have named these parables certain things. But I, I like to say it's the renters and the landlord broken promises. Jesus in this text right before had already shared a parable, a story, 
and this is in Jerusalem, and he shared this story, and now he says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. Now, we have some people that own a vineyard. A lot of work, isn't it? He invited me to come and help him harvest this year. In fact, he has open invitation to everyone in the church to come and help harvest this year. That would be all right, wouldn't it? This landowner planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it. That's to keep the critters out. Um, I know you've got an electric fence to keep the raccoons out, and the deer, and the antelope. You guys see my garden. I've got a seven and a half foot fence. I put it up because the deer were just decimating my garden because the neighbor feeds them. <laughs> and so um, they, were, they would eat their, their food over there and come over for the salad bar at my garden. And I put up a seven and a half foot fence. And I went out one time and I watched a buck jump that like I would jump a curb. And I was like, well, yeah, well, I got my revenge. I shot that deer with a pellet gun. You thought I was going to say 30-30, didn't you? I shot him with a pellet gun right in the rear end. He jumped the next fence just as easily or more. And he goes to the woods and goes, he's mad. But anyway, I had to put sticks around my garden to keep the deer out. But this guy built a wall. I mean, this guy is putting a lot of time, effort, and money into making this beautiful vineyard. And then he built a watchtower. Now, the watchtower, as far as I can figure out, is so that a uh, um, person with a scope and a rifle can pick off the deer when they get close to the grapes. That's what I think. You know, one time I came in, I was so frustrated because the deer had decimated my garden again. And I said, man, can you, or I was telling Rhonda, we have these philosophical talks all the time. I was telling Rhonda, I said, well, you know, what about these pioneers? They used to have to live off their garden. They, did, they couldn't go to the supermarket and get food and, you know, all. And they, they depended on that garden. What do they do when a raccoon comes in or a deer comes in and decimates their garden? She said, honey, back then they just call it table meat because you could go out and shoot it if it was in your garden. I'm like, well, yeah, good thought. Hey, hey venison is. Venison's to go with our potatoes this week. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. Okay, he, uh, he rented it. They were tenant farmers. They were very much like my grandpa. But they weren't going to make good on the deal. This person that owned the land had put in so much work. The vineyard was ready to go. Even had a wine press, everything in it, ready to go. And these farmers come in and they, they shook hands, but these guys didn't plan on following through. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. And he would have sent some people, some guys in a, in a, in a, in a cart, and they wanted to have their grapes. Standard. And it's amazing how... Renting land is the same now as it was back then, that the landowner got a portion of the profits. And so he sent some servants to go and bring back a lot of the grapes so they could probably make wine. That's why they would typically do is they would make wine out of those grapes. Well, it says in verse 35, the tenant seized his servants that came back for their, you know, the owner's profit. They beat one, they killed another, and they stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son, his very own son to them, 
and said, Oh, he, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Oh, come, let's kill him. And then we will take the inheritance. And so they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now, a little side note here. When they threw him out of the vineyard, in, in biblical times, if you killed an innocent man or an innocent woman somewhere, that ground was cursed. And so these farmers were like, well, we don't want cursed land. Let's drag him out to the neighbor's property and then kill him. And then their neighbor's land will be cursed, but not ours. Yeah, they're that wicked. Now this parable, I mean, it's, it's fairly easy to recognize what it was. You see, you had this crowd. Jesus' and disciples were there, the people that oftentimes followed him. But you also had a large crowd gather around Jesus to hear his stories, to hear him preach. And along with that crowd, there were always some people there as well. Who were they? Pharisees. Religious leaders. There was also chief priests, or at least representatives of the chief priests there, to hear Jesus' story. They wanted to always trap him. They always wanted to find something they could bring charges against him. And so they were there in the crowd too, and they would there be in their nice robes. And they were not happy people. They did not like Jesus. And they knew that if Jesus, what Jesus was preaching would catch on, they were out of business. They wouldn't be respected then. And so they had a jealousy to begin with. And these Pharisees always were around Jesus and kind of a thorn for Jesus. And they knew that Jesus was talking about them. They knew this story was about Israel and religious leaders and kings of old. And that God had sent prophet after prophet after prophet to Israel to instruct them on how to live and how to be and how to be with God. But typically with Israel, they would take the prophets and beat them. They would jail them. They would kick them out of Jerusalem. And yes, they would kill them. And we see some of the prophets listed in the Old Testament and what they did. Jeremiah was beaten several times and thrown in prison. And, you know, all this time, God would send prophets to Israel and religious leaders and the kings of Israel would mistreat them, hurt them, punish them. And kill them. And this is what Jesus is talking about with all the servants coming and saying, Hey, where's God's, where's God, where's God's part? In this story, of course, God is the owner of this vineyard. And the people of Israel were the ones that made a deal with him. But they have not kept the deal. And when the servants would come and say, Hey, where's God's part? We're not going to pay it. We're not going to do it. We're going to do our own thing. And then Jesus said, and then the owner sent his very own son to them saying, oh, surely they'll respect my son. And what did they do? They took him out and they butchered him. And they knew, the Pharisees knew that this was a parable indicting them. And what will happen in the future? Jesus is foreshadowing that the Son of God, Jesus himself, would be killed by these, those same people. Just like he shared in the parable. Therefore, Jesus asked the crowd, he said, therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes back, what will he do to those tenants? Oh, and someone in the crowd said, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end. I love wretch, the word wretch. 
Someone else in the crowd spoke up and said, And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at the harvest time, who will do the right thing, who will know God provided all this, and now it's time to pay it back, <coughs> the fair share. Now, as I said, this is about Israel. <coughs> and I believe that God was talking, or Jesus was talking about the new tenants that would come. I believe that that will be us who follow Jesus Christ, who inherit all of this, you know, that God has provided. And think about all the blessings that we have. Think about all that God has provided. And we can read into this another story, too, that these tenants weren't thankful for what they had. This, this, I, I suspect this farm, this vineyard produced a lot of fruit. And it was perfect for this. And yet they didn't want to give back. And in the same way, sometimes I believe God has granted us blessings. God has given us so much, and we don't show thankfulness. We are not gracious to God. We do not give back to God in so many ways. And we do not show gratitude when gratitude is needed. Could that be us? Oh, we give one day a year. Thanksgiving. But why do we wait till Thanksgiving? Why can't we give our gratitude and our thankfulness every day? The Apostle Paul said this in 1 Thessalonians. Rejoice always. These are, this is the way to live. If you want to live well, here it is. Here are the, here's the thing, way to live. Rejoice always. Do we rejoice? Pray continually. He said, e no matter what their circumstances, pray continually. Do we pray? Do we pray often? Do we pray every day? You can pray while you're driving the car. In early service they said, but keep your eyes open. It's a little handy clue. Do you pray before you get your coffee and after you drink your coffee? Do we pray before we go to bed at night? Pray continually is what he says. And give thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks, my friends, to God. No matter how bad things might get, we still have things to be thankful for. So we give thanks. So we rejoice we pray and we give thanks. Those are three things to live by. In Deuteronomy, in the Old Testament, um, <clears throat> it's the Shema. It's in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. In the Shema, every Hebrew would have known this. And Jesus quotes it later on in the New Testament. But here it is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This is how we live, and this is how we give back to God. These tenants, they weren't about to. These Jewish leaders were not going to do so. And they had turned the, the religion of the Hebrews into something that God never intended. And so this is why Jesus shares this parable. But also, Jesus is trying to upset the Pharisees. It wasn't hard to do. They were a cranky group of people. But Jesus shares this parable because he's trying to upset them. And we see the further part of this parable, or after the parable, and we see kind of what's going on. <clears throat> Jesus said to them, Have you never read the Scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And the Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is out of Psalms, and it's one of the, one of the uh, um, prophecy pieces about the coming of the Messiah that everyone would have known. 
Testament. And Jesus is quoting this as the prophecy about the Messiah. The, the, the stone the builder said, oh, that's not any good. It eventually became the foundation piece. And it's talking about Jesus. The religious leaders excluded him, rejected him. But he becomes the cornerstone of the faith movement of Christianity. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people who will produce its fruit. He's saying it will be taken away from you all and given to others. And the others, I think he's talking about us, who will produce fruit. The fruit of the Spirit, you might say, the fruit of God, that we will do something with it. We can pay back God by by helping others and being there for others. And this vineyard is marvelous spot. And we're giving it to us. And we, all we have to pay is a portion of it. This is what we're supposed to be doing in this world. Of course, the Pharisees are getting angry. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and anyone who fall, it falls on will be crushed. When the chief priest and the Pharisees, you're supposed to go boo. There you go. When these Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. And so they looked for a way to arrest him. Eventually, out of jealousy and anger and everything else, these Pharisees and these Sadducees and the priestly class, they will get to the point that they want Jesus dead by any means at any time, and they set up a plan to get rid of Jesus. But what they didn't know was Jesus was intentionally guiding them toward that because his mission was to die on that cross for us. And he had to get them to the point that they wanted him gone so badly, they were willing to break two of the Ten Commandments. They brought false witnesses at his trial, and they murdered an innocent person, breaking two of the Ten Commandments. So this was Jesus' plan. And so basically the Pharisees were kind of playing in to the plan that Jesus had, so that he would die for our sins, and then, of course, be resurrected. <clears throat> well, they looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet, a prophet from God. And they weren't going to allow anything to happen. And this is why later on, just not too far away, they're going to arrest him at middle of the night when no one can see it, when no one can cause a riot. And they'll eventually beat him and kill him on the cross. The folks we owe so much to God, are we thankful? Do we show gratitude? Are we truly, truly grateful? Amen. I hope you're with us next week <coughs> as I continue on with the parable series. And each week we'll, we'll cover a different parable of Jesus. We will learn more about who Jesus was. We will learn about what God wants for our lives and how we live for Him. Amen? We please rise for the benediction. Yeah, I saw the, the, the field, the farm they brought up. Except for the mountain, it did kind of look like Grandpa's farm. But he didn't have any mountains. That's not Greene County, Missouri. Jesus tells us to go and make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and show with them all that I have given you. Amen. Amen.